my talk's called Land-Based Natural Capital, and uh, you'll see I make an acknowledgement to my student, Maya Finvers. Maya has gone back to Canada now. She's a mature student. She's responsible for soil protection in British Columbia. Uh, so we had a very good year together doing uh, some studying and some research, and there's one or two things that I've borrowed from Maya in my presentation. So uh, thank you to Maya as well. Uh, it, I think it's just a week or two weeks that the 40th anniversary of people landing on the moon. I don't know whether you saw some of the old videos of the first steps onto the moon. And the truly iconic picture of our planet seen from the surface of the moon. And when that uh, image emerged, oh, by the way, I didn't see the, uh, the landing because I was with my friend traveling through uh, the Dordogne region sampling wine, and there was no um, easy access to a television. I was a young man then. So, um, so this, this image is the one that really leads us over the last 40 years and probably the next 50 years to a different relationship between man and the planet. It crystallized in humanity's mind the reality that we live on a small planet in an ocean of nothingness and that we have to look after this planet. It is just what we have. We have nothing else but this one. And out of that gradually emerges something different to environmental science, which is uh, perhaps uh, brought out in this, these ideas which are currently called natural capital. So um, we had a picture of Uncle Karl Marx this morning. I don't know why we always call him Uncle Karl in, uh, in Britain. And he was a resident, you know. He was one of these um, people who came to London to escape various political um, problems and wrote his famous book, Das Kapital, in Soho. Anyway, so um, Marx had no idea of natural capital, as I understand it. But about the same time, perhaps a little bit later, there are some people in America um, who are exploring a thing which they call transcendentalism. They went and stayed in entirely natural environments for quite some time, and out of this tried to understand the relationship of man and nature. And from that antecedent, we get some ideas of natural capital. So if we look at um, how we survive on this planet, we survive primarily because of natural capital. And then we have as well manufactured capital, which is in essence what uh, Marx was talking about in his uh, theory of labor value. And then more recently we have human capital, which is what we're trying to develop here today, which is knowledge in, and skills in human beings. And last but not least, we have this concept of social capital. Commonly, I think, uh, a lot of things which we do in our lives are not done for financial benefit. For example, I try to look after my mother, but nobody pays me for that. That's a social relationship that I have that I look after. So we have these different forms of, of, of capital, and the one that I want to focus on is natural capital. Um, this morning, we have some discussion here, so it's possible to, to I think, uh, make uh, some commentary on earlier presentations. This morning, we had what I saw as a modernist view of uh, how you manage land, which is um, essentially saying that uh, man is a little dis distance from, uh, from uh, nature. Um, man sits uh, in a altogether uh, elevated position relative to the rest of nature. Uh, I think there's something about this in, in, in the Bible, actually. And uh, the idea underlying it is that 
as human beings, we're in altogether different relationship to God uh, than, um, than the rest of nature. Now, I think this is ridiculous. Yeah? And in the modernist view, we can uh, imagine that somehow we can plan land and plan resources as if we were some kind of God. And uh, the postmodernist view, which I hold on to, is that we are part of nature, yeah? that we respond uh, to the way that nature takes us. And everything we do is, in effect, a part of nature. So man is a part of nature, a part of nature, and not apart from it. Little play on the English there. Okay? So this is by way of sort of introduction, more philosophical stuff. But um, we're going to move on, I'm afraid, and enter into some more technical things. Um, so just so we've got ourselves orientated, we should first of all uh, look through these services, so-called ecosystem services, and make sure we know the different kinds that exist. Because these are the services that we draw off from natural capital. The first kind are, are supporting services. Actually, there's a bit of confusion. They're sometimes called functions. So let's not confuse. We'll call them supporting services. They're, they're natural processes that support delivery of services that humanity needs. So they include things like photosynthesis, nutrient cycling. So those are supporting services. Then there's a set which we call provisioning services, and these, um, these provide things that we directly need, food, fiber, various raw materials, and so on. Now, very importantly, if we just go back a moment and look at this planet, it is, of course, highly regulated, uh, not by regulators uh, of a human kind, not by the European Commission or the United Nations Environment Programme, but by itself, yes? So there are natural regulatory processes that keep this planet in, 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 in a good state of life, yeah? And uh, we can just say for a moment that there was a famous person called John Ruskin, yeah? And uh, he said that there is no wealth but life. So when we look at life on the planet, that is the wealth we have. It's actually a highly regulated system, naturally regulated. So these regulatory services include, of course, climate regulation. Um, they include, for example, uh, the control of diseases, in, which are themselves regulatory mechanisms. So we have a set of services which are regulatory services. And then finally, from a human perspective, we have cultural services. I mean, this is a, this is a specifically human perspective. Uh, I don't think that uh, the birds that fly around really recognize cultural services for humanity. But we certainly do, and these include the aesthetic and spiritual aspects of our, of our own ecology. And of course, those uh, aesthetic and spiritual aspects, I would say, are natural, just the same as everything else. I definitely don't think human beings are apart from nature. We are part of it. So this idea of natural capital really comes from uh, a concept that you have an asset base or a store or a capacity to deliver services of these kinds. And you've probably seen this diagram already, I think, have you? The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment <coughs> flow sheet. Recognize it? Oh, well, if you haven't seen it, you can see it now. That's good. So um, the important thing here is you can see that uh, we have the supporting services over on the left and then the provisioning, regulating and cultural services that draw down on the natural processes which are supporting them. And then on the right-hand side, we have so-called constituents of well-being. And these are very much, if you're familiar with Philip Maslow's idea of hierarchy of need, you know, which is a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid, the basic things that we need as human beings are food, water, and shelter. And then a little bit higher, we need some social things, and eventually we aspire to something cultural, and eventually you, 
I know some of you probably know the phrase, you've become self-actualized, meaning you've become a complete human, complete being, yeah? But you can't, according to Maslow, you can't go f just to the top. You have to work your way up. So the constituents of well-being include security, basic things like shelter, uh, health, and good social relations, which are a bit higher in the hierarchy. And finally, you self-actualize when you've got freedom of choice yeah, and liberty. So uh, this, this is a kind of uh, way of sep setting out the relationships between natural processes, the supporting ecosystem services, and our experience as human beings, the construct in which we live, uh, the constituents of well-being. Now, there's some arrows in the middle, and these are very interesting arrows because they tell us something about how we as human beings can escape from uh, a complete reliance on nature. Um, in every case when we do this, it seems to me that we do it by substituting um, today's sunlight by yesterday's sunlight. In other words, we, we introduce forms of energy uh, which are not current, are not part of the natural processes. So if you look at the thickness of the arrows, it tells you which substitution can take place. And so it's not uh, necessary for us to just simply rely on trees for shelter. We can substitute um, trees by houses, and we can construct houses. So this gives you some idea, I think, of the very, very complex relationships of human beings to uh, natural processes on the planet. And everything that's happening, everything that's happening in this slide is really driven by energy which is derived from the sun. Of course, some of the, some of the energy is derived uh, through, directly through radiant energy and thermal processes. But a good part of it is derived via photosynthesis. And so at the heart of our existence on the planet is the carbon cycle. As we've lately discovered to our horror, uh, we've disturbed the most fundamental geochemical cycle, the carbon cycle, to an extent where the regular, natural regulating processes of the planet have been overtaken. And I'll come back to this in a moment when we try in a moment to explore what we really mean by natural capital. So what, at this stage, a little summary, what might we think is natural capital, land-based natural capital? I'm just focusing on natural capital in land. And I would say natural capital represents capacity to do work, yeah? delivering services and goods. So. It's more or less like a natural science, if you like. Capacity to do work. And um, where does this, how does this work get done? What drives it? Where's the energy that provides the capacity to do this work? It comes from uh, plants that fix carbon. And it, it's delivered through what I think is most usefully described as biological engines. So those of you, I know there are some of you who are engineers and physicists and so on. I'm sure you, you can see the parallel here with some of the thermodynamics. So we need to, I think now, have a little exploration of what we mean by biological engines. But first of all, um, if, we, if we say, OK, well, there's some natural capital in the land, and this presents a capacity to deliver various types of services, you might well ask the question, if I go out onto a piece of land, can I recognize it? it? What would I see? What are the features in the landscape that represent this capital that you're talking about? And to me, I think these are the key ones. First of all, genetic resources. Right? So <clears throat> life has if you like, a, an, in, an index of possibilities that's contained in the genetic code. 
And then this is expressed in the phenotype and then on and upwards. And that expression depends on the context in which the genetic uh, potential is, is realized. So genetic resources definitely are a form of natural capital. They represent a possibility to do different types of work, to deliver different types of services. But it's only possible for the phenotype to be expressed and for the work to be done if there's a medium for it to be done in. So another part of the natural capital is the soil and the water system in the land. That provides a medium for the expression of the genetic resources. Now, as well, that expression requires energy. Where does that energy come from? Well, it comes from photosynthesis. But the reservoirs in the land-based system actually sit in the soil in the form of soil organic carbon. And we'll explore that a bit more in a moment. So if, ye, if we say, well, you know, what's the most important thing out there? I mean, water is there, of course, and plants are there, and hopefully it's a sunny day and there's some sunlight there bringing radiant energy. But what is this natural capital? Well, a good part of it, unquestionably, is the soil system. The soil system contains a huge genetic resource. It's the medium for expression of genetic resources above and below ground. And it also has these important reservoirs of carbon, which can drive the soil system and so allow the plants to uh, uh, make full use of sunlight and water. So I, my idea, the thing I want to get across at this stage, is that soil systems are really the dominant form of natural capital in, in land systems. So let's have a li little look now at this idea of um, biological engines, the soil engine. So essentially we have carbon, um, just the same as we have an internal combustion engine. We bring some carbon in and we extract from that uh, energy by burning it um, to do work. And at the bottom, there's quite a sort of complicated sentence. And it's an attempt to try and say, well, of course, it's not an engine. It's not like a diesel engine or a steam engine, but it is a thermodynamic engine. And it, uh, it can't be described in the kind of sort of uh, deterministic and, 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 and concrete way that most engines that we encounter can be. It's, rather than that, it's a very complex, connected set of life systems that work together, work in concert. And the way that they work is determined by the absolute detail of the soil habitat, the physical structure within the soil system, the pores, the gaps, the assemblies of minerals, the water, the organic matter, and so on. We can't only really describe this engine in terms of statistical distributions, and I, I don't think we'll do that this afternoon. So what's this engine actually doing? What, you know, what kind of work is it doing? It's actually doing work delivering supporting services. I've called them functional delivery, but it's really supporting services. It's, it, of course, is supporting the delivery of, for example, food. But uh, that's a provisioning service. So if we just recall the um, model we had earlier, the supporting services provide the foundation for the delivery of, say, provisioning services, regulatory services, and so on. And most of what the soil engine is doing is providing supporting services. So it takes organic carbon in directly from plants or from carbon that it's already degraded from plant material to other forms. That's transformed ultimately to carbon dioxide. And a number of functions are performed or supporting services are formed. Now this engine, as I've said, is not something you can go out and find very easily. So you have to disengage an idea of an you know, objective concrete engine in your minds. It's... it's um, an engine that operates at a whole range of scales, from micron scales to kilometer scales. It's an engine that's here, and it's over there at the same time. So it's a difficult uh, 
end, thermodynamic terms again, it's a different, difficult engine to describe because it's hard to identify where the boundary conditions are for the engine. If we change the soil habitat, if, for example, we drain a soil, then we change the environment in which the genetic resources in the soil are transformed into the phenotype and ultimately into the systems and the working engine. So we can change the performance of this engine by changing the soil structure. Now, let's, let's leave soil for a moment and think about human beings. Uh, lunchtime, uh, a few of us were watching people in the Tour de France. We saw the yellow jersey. And um, I thought, oh, good, we'll be covering that this afternoon. Um, let's just stop for a moment. When, when, who, who does competitive sports here? Who's an athlete? Or? There's one at the back, but he's, uh, he's one of the professors. So are none of you doing competitive sports? There's a, li there's a little, there's a small hand going up over there. There's maybe a slight interest over here. Somebody swimming. I'm walking the dog. He, he walks the dog. Marathon running, 10 kilometers. Yes? Come on, guys. You should be doing it every day. No? Dear, dear. Tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, 5 kilometers, I think. Now, let's imagine we did that, because you're obviously not very fit. And I noticed some of you are smoking, by the way, so that's not so good. But anyway, um, if, if we were to get up tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, meet down just by the front door there, and do five kilometers, how would you feel in the first 100 meters? OK. You'd feel OK, would you? First 100 meters. We go off at a good pace, yeah? We're going quite quickly. First 100 meters, you feel quite good, yeah? Around uh, about 500 meters, how do you feel? Depressed, I should think. I mean, wondering how you're going to make the full five kilometers. During that first 100 meters, if we set off quickly, you're going to burn carbon that's easily accessible by your body, yeah? Maybe the remnants of um, some a high sugary drink that you had the day before. Yeah? The glycogen reserves that are easily accessible. That's because the body doesn't have to pay much tax to use that energy. Yeah? So as soon as you start using it, you get the full impact and you don't have to invest very much. Round about five kilometers, you probably burnt off most of that easily accessible sugar and you're now moving into more complex carbohydrate and the cost of the body to get that energy out is higher. It has to invest more energy to get that, that energy out. So it's getting tougher, yeah? And you will begin to feel tired. But once you've made that transition, you'll feel quite good again. And of course, when you're training, it's, uh, as I understand it, if you're training for co competitive sports, you need to get to a point where you can quite quickly move into using complex carbohydrate. And that gives you the possibility of stamina and pace. However, if you go on a lot further, eventually you've used up the accessible complex carbohydrate and then you will start to burn fat. And that, that fat costs even more. So the body doesn't use that until it has to use it. But once it's used up your sugars and your carbohydrate, it moves on to another form of carbon which is more costly. Yeah? You'll see the purpose of this in a moment. Ultimately, if you don't have uh, enough energy from complex carbohydrate and fats, you will start to burn protein, which is very, actually very costly to the body. And of course, protein is pretty well structural. So what you're doing then is you're starting to destroy the actual structure of you as an organism in order to keep going. I think probably even if we did five kilometers tomorrow, Frank, I don't think we'd be burning much protein. Um, but if we did five kilometers every day collecting water in Africa for our family and we had a low dietary intake, 
we would be burning protein and eventually we would be malnourished and we'd die of starvation. So we're very fortunate, aren't we? Anyway, the point about this is we're just part of nature. Nature behaves in common ways and human beings are no different. So we have a system for getting at carbon which allows us to go for the easy carbon first, the carbon that costs less in terms of the energy input to get energy out, and eventually we work our way down. And if we look at soil systems in land, then the same thing exists. There is, an, there is a parallel, an analogous. So if we look at terrestrial energy reserves, then we have this biological engine running. Uh, uh, sorry, I've started to indicate it's got pistons or something like that. And we shouldn't do that. But it's a thermodynamic engine. If, if we look at the sources of carbon that run that engine, then they are actually in different, different forms. Um, first of all, we have fresh plant residues. Um, and then those residues are converted into more complex materials, including microbial polysaccharides around the extracellular polysaccharide, for example. Then we have the cell walls themselves, phospholipids and so on. And then deeper down, we have soil organic matter, which is heterogeneous. And just like the soil engine, it's very difficult to describe. It can only be described, really, in terms of distributions of different types of carbon. And some of the soil organic matter is relatively easily extracted in terms of energy extraction, and some of it is much more difficult. And if we look at the half-life, if we measure the time that these different types of materials have been in the soil before they're metabolized, then we can get an idea from that uh, about which ones are being used for rapid turnover, i.e. like we use glucose, uh, glycogen and uh, complex carbohydrates, and those which are, if you like, structural, analogous to proteins in human beings. So the fresh plant residue, if you put it into a soil, within a few weeks, uh, the half-life, possibly even days, depending on the, on, the, um, on the soil and the conditions, that material will be taken in. Some of it will be burnt off, converted to CO2, and some of it will be converted into more complex carbohydrate. And at the other end, some of the organic carbon that's in this, I've called heavy soil organic matter, has half-lives that actually extend into centuries. So it's very, very deep structural carbon. So where do you think the natural capital is in soil? We've got the genetic resources, and we've got some structure in terms of a soil pore structure in which microbes and other, other organisms can live, but they need energy. And what's the, where, where's the energy reservoir? Well, the answer is it's in, it's in these forms, in the soil organic carbon, which the microorganisms can draw down. And in just the same way as that poor woman who's collecting water in Africa is degraded by having to collect water without a sufficient supply of food energy. If we, if we run our soil systems really hard, year after year after year, we start to burn off the structural carbon, which actually provides the habitat for the engine itself. So uh, um, if, if we just have a look at, you know, Cranfield, by the way, is a little bit north of London, and... Uh, I, I should have said, as Frank said, we're just a graduate university, so only masters and PhDs, and we're quite small. We've only got about four and a half thousand masters and PhD students currently, and we focus on technology things. But this is something that my department colleagues in my department uh, put out about almost five years ago now, um, published in Nature at the time, and it shows us the rate of change. Um, sorry, I haven't, got the, I haven't got any numbers here. I'm sorry for that. But actually what it says is on the, on the left-hand side, the darker it is, the more carbon there is in the soil. And on the right-hand side, the darker it is, the higher the rate of 
carbon losses. The important thing to know is that pretty well on average, there's a quite large reduction in, in carbon taking place. And England and Wales are no different probably to other parts of northern temperate countries. So this means that we're losing this reservoir of organic carbon rather rapidly at the moment. So I'll just pause there. Well, are you convinced by my fanciful tale? I mean, are you convinced, Frank? I, I mean, if that, that's interesting because not everybody is convinced by this idea. The same course like yeah, indeed. Do you get the idea of we have a biological engine and this biological engine has to have certain resources, otherwise it can't continue. And so the natural capital, the capacity to deliver these different services is intimately associated with the soil organic carbon and uh, therefore we should be looking after it and we should be looking after soils. So in a moment I'm going to look a little bit more at soil protection and the workshop uh, exercises about that. But th this first part was really to try and explain why soil systems are very important, I mean critically important for uh, a healthy planet. Let's, um, let's do a little bit of revision now. You know, I, I like in lectures sort of go back a bit and go over one or two things again. Um, and these are some tables that Maya produced that I thought would be useful. I don't propose to go through them in detail. Let's pick out a few. Um, well, the first one, support for above ground biodiversity. What do I mean by above ground biodiversity? Human beings, I suppose, yeah. Plants, animals, insects above the soil system. Um, nutrient cycling. So, obviously, if the soil system, the end, the, that biological engine wasn't taking carbon from uh, uh, the above ground system and recycling it and all the nutrients in it, uh, the system would actually come to a halt. And um, in, in here we've got, again, mainly provisioning and regulating services. And there's a very, very long list of services that, for example, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment identified. We couldn't possibly go through all these. So I'm not, I'm not going to read all these out, but you know they're there in case you do the workshop or, or if you just want to have a look back afterwards. So let's move on now to a question. Are there enough global soil resources? Because if we conclude that soils are absolutely foundational to life systems on the planet, and if, you, if we accept that we're part of nature and therefore if the planet gets into trouble, basically we're in trouble, then we need to know have we got enough global soil resources. And from a human perspective, we know the world population will grow by about 40% by 2050. There is nothing to stop it. It will definitely happen. It's to do with demography. It's to do with the age structures, changes in income patterns, and so on. So we know for a fact that our crowded planet will be 40% more crowded in the space of about 40 years. But thankfully... I mean, we really should be glad of this. We have to be glad of it. About a billion people are going to move over the $5 a day threshold. And when people move over the $5 a day threshold, one of the first things they do is change their diet. Because over that $5 a day, uh, you can move from uh, a cereal-based diet maybe rice or maize meal or whatever, into one with a little bit more protein in it. And so as a result of that, the demand for food will increase by more than 40% because producing protein is much less efficient than, well, it requires much more resource and land than does producing plant food. So we know that the demand for food will grow dramatically. And then on top of that, the industrialized world is looking to replace oil with 
carbon produced in crops for energy, for fiber, for chemicals, for pharmaceuticals, and so on. So it looks to me like the soil resources are going to be really, really stretched. If we look at this inherent land quality assessment, famous slide, I think, it tells us something. If you look down in the left-hand corner, we've got uh, soil performance. So soils that have a high performance are more yellow, and soils that are particularly resilient uh, are green. So the ideal is to have lots of green soils. And I think you can see that the green soils are really quite scarce. And if we look at the impacts of climate change on these areas of land that are green now, unfortunately they shrink. And furthermore, we're managing these soils very badly at the present time. So, for example, the ones that are in South America look to be possibly substantially degraded. And if we look forward to about 2050, then we're simply left with really these areas. On a, on a worse or medium worse kind scenario, it looks like we would have a reduced area in the Midwest of North America for food production, an area in North East China and an area stretching through Northern France, Northern Germany, a little bit in the UK actually, and then across to the Ural Mountains. And that's it. That looks to be what we will be left with to grow food for a population that's 40% higher than the current population. And to my mind, that's really scary. It's true that in Africa, there are many soils that have great potential. But for those of us who've worked in Africa, we cannot feel confident that they have the institutional and governance and social and human capital that would allow them to uh, develop those natural resources. So it's a really, I think it's a really scary uh, scenario. Um, and I wish you the very best of luck because you will all mostly, I guess, hopefully, all be alive in 40 years' time. It's unlikely I will be. So I wish you the very best uh, for a difficult time. But most importantly, I wish you the very best of luck to deal with this problem for your children. Because you might survive it, but they might not. It's very emotional language, but it's important, I think, to be clear. And here's the 2007, just a you know, this is for the policy community. If, uh, if it's a blue cow, it means that there'll be more cows. And if it's a red cow, it means there'll be less cows. This is how you speak to the policy community, in my experience. And I think you can see that there are a few places where there are blue cows, but there are an awful lot of red cows. And equally, there are a few places, very few, in fact, really only two, where there's blue bunches of cereals. That is, in uh, the Far East, you can see one there in Southeast Asia, and uh, where I live, in the United Kingdom. But I think that really covers northern France as well. So it, it, it's not a very nice scenario. So we need to protect our soils in Europe and in other parts of the world as most, I think, are from Europe, we need to recognize we have a global responsibility for soil protection. It's not simply about protecting soil resources for Europe. It's about noticing and acting upon the fact that the soil resources in Europe are one of the few sets of soil resources that are likely to remain in half a century's time. So here are a few conclusions from, the, the, from my first bit. Um, natural capital is essentially what we live on. If you look at that image of planet Earth taken from the moon, then it's the natural capital which is foundational for everything, including human well-being. I hope I've tried to, I hope I've convinced you that soil is the dominant form of natural capital in land. And I hope I've interested you in soil organic carbon, because that carbon is really the reservoir of capacity to uh, deliver services. It is a form of natural capital. 
And these last few slides were really about underlining the strategic imperative of protecting soil resources.